Hi, all. Um, so today, I will share with you some of the things that I learned in the past years by uh, leading teams. Uh, um, one of the most important things that I learned was how to focus on individuals and uh, how to recognize the strength that people have rather than work on the limitations. Um, when you find a way to balance uh, all the different personalities in your team, you can actually achieve, uh, you can actually build a really fantastic team. And by fantastic team, I mean a team that can um, help themselves, a team where everybody balances the limitations uh, and everybody leverages on the strength of um, every colleague. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. And um, I was a webmaster when being a webmaster was actually a cool thing. We're talking about 15 years ago. You would go around and be proud about being called a webmaster. Now, not so much. Um, <laughs> then I've been leading team for the last 14 years in, uh, in three countries. Uh, and I've been working in a different type, uh, different type of companies, from startup to, to big corporate to fast growing business. That is where, uh, where I really thrive. Um, I've been working on, uh, uh, with, with on-site and with remote team, uh, and uh, I'm currently leading an amazing tech team at the Gino that is a biotech marketplace. We are, we are, we are kind of like revolutionizing the way the life science uh, uh, system works, but I'm not here to talk about that today. Today, I'm here to talk about leadership. So as some of the talks went through already, um, you go from you know, junior, intermediate expert, and then you think that the next step is managing people. And when you go into the next step, uh, you realize an important thing, that mistakes uh, have a different reflection. So you work initially with, uh, with bugs, and then you work with design, you work with project management, uh, um, or you work with code, you don't work with bugs, but as a developer, I always say you create bugs. Um, and, uh, and when you have issues, you, you fix the code, you have hacks, uh, you, or you properly rewrite the code, you, you re redesign some of the things, uh, or you reassess some of the parts in your project management. When you make mistakes with people, uh, you actually have emotions, and uh, emotions are a lot harder to deal with. You create relationship issues, you create uh, imbalances in your team, or worse, uh, you put a weight on the individual of uh, inadequacy. So one of the things that um, is key to leadership is to be able to earn the trust and the respect from the individuals. If you work in a great company, usually the team is going to trust you by default because they trust your CV, they trust uh, the company's choice in hiring you as their lead. Uh, but eventually you have to live up to the expectations. Uh, and um, one of the things that you have to do is first of, all, first of all trust people first. You have to be the first one to put a trust in the individuals. Uh, and you have to be able to motivate every single person that you work with. So how do you motivate them? You motivate them by making sure that you build the environment around them in a way that the environment fits each personality that you have in your team. You don't try to take each individual and push them into an environment that you think is cool, you think is great. So Albert Einstein once said that everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And what we do in companies, we ask fishes to climb mountains, and then we ask fishes to come back from the mountains, and then run marathons, and then swim. This creates a huge feeling of inadequacy to the fish, and, uh, and sometimes we also tell the fish that they're not up to the task, they're too slow, they're too lazy, um, when actually we just push them into something that they're just not able to do, they're not used to do, for, for genetic, for epigenetic, for brain plasticity reason, whatever you want, but we just try to push people into some areas they're not comfortable with. So what we have to do as leads, but also as team members, is um, we have to build a pond uh, where the fish can swim and leverage on the fish strength, uh, and then we have to allow the fish to walk out of the pond if they want, and we have to provide the support if that is exactly what they want to do. And that's how people eventually grow, if they want to grow in that direction. Otherwise, a fish swimming in a pond can be just excellent as is. So if you have a look at primitive societies, you can um, see that we have different roles. We had hunters, we had leaders, we had gatherers, we had people taking care of the community. But if we look at the behaviors, different behavioral patterns that people had, you had people that were comfortable in following routines, people that were comfortable with monotonous tasks. You had uh, people that were constantly innovating, trying to look for new ways of performing specific actions. You had people that were scared of getting out of the cave because you know there is a tiger and the tiger will hit you. And then you had people that uh, wanted to get a thrill of jumping off a cliff and getting out of the cave and going to a new cave because you know, that's how we eventually find better caves. 
and taking the risk for that. So from an evolutionary point of view, this worked, that this was great. This is why we as society work well. This is why we want to embrace diversity on all fields. But what we do in, um, in our companies is a little bit like the same mistakes that we make in education, in most education system. We, we take our children and uh, we push them into a memorize and pass the test kind of system. And this works with some, but doesn't really work with everybody. So when you build a company, you're not building a business, you're building the people that build the product or build the service that you're eventually going to provide to the people. And, and a company is really made by the people, and uh, everybody has a different background of personalities, a different way of reacting, a different way of interacting with the environment. And we need to be able to make sure that whatever process, whatever environment we create, uh, we build that around the people that we have in the company. And we recognize what kind of people we have in the company, and we build everything around them, rather than the other way around. So it's really important that the process is built around the people not the other way around. You don't want to find uh, a new type of agile process, a new lean, Kanban, scrum, waterfall, whatever, and say, this is what we do. You have not to follow the process. You want to look at the people that you have, at the way they work, uh, and then trying to build the process around them. And then when somebody else joins the company, if you really embrace diversity, you want to allow them to break the process and then fine tune the process on top of the new team that you have, because that's really how you build inclusion, how you build diversity in your team. Otherwise, you're just going to kill it by forcing everybody to behave in the same way. So when we talk about neurodiversity, for example, neurodiversity is defined as the range of differences in individual brain function and behavioral traits regarded as a part of a normal variation in a human population. A lot of the things that we call today uh, mental illnesses, for example, uh, there are some debates whether these are just genetical traits and uh, different way of our brain to work uh, and interact with the environment. And um, um, there are a lot of expectations in society, as we all know, and, and as we've seen in a lot of areas in this conference, for example, um, of behaving in a certain ways and of fitting in a particular way in the, in, in the society and in the company. And we have to really fight against these things and recognize that uh, each one of us has unique strengths as well as, as well as limitation. So if we try to push personalities into a single way of working, we just look at the limitation because these are the first ones that come right away. And we don't really discover the strength and we actually kill them. And this cause also can cause a, a lot of issues like uh, depression, it can cause a personality um, uh, um, disorders, can, can, cause, uh, can cause anxieties in some ways. Uh, and, um, to make an example a little bit clearer now, I will go through maybe four of the examples of personalities and neurotypes that you uh, may have to deal with, that you may have yourself, that uh, you may know somebody with, and how we can look at those from a different light. So the first thing I would like to talk about is uh, anxiety disorder. So anxiety disorder is defined as uh, an extreme fear or worry. Uh, basically, you get this crashing sensation to the chest, the panic attacks, uh, you get palpitations. It's almost like you're about to talk in front of a huge crowd for the first time, uh, but on small uh, mundane tasks like going to do the shopping, something that you can do every day. You plan before you realize, uh, you, you, you think about after, you overthink about what happened, and you need to have uh, all sorts of plan A, B, C, uh, for, for, for all sort of things that you do. And it can be a general anxiety disorder, it can be a, a social anxiety disorder, it can be an OCD, it can be anything really. And it's estimated that 20% of adult population have it in mild or severe form, even though very few of the people in the adult population know that they have it. And, um, but one of the things that we can see in anxiety disorder is that uh, there is an incredible attention to details usually brought by these personalities into any task. Why? Because they have to understand, they have to be in control of things, they have to be feeling like they are in a safe space, and safe means they understand and they are in control of the situations, of the environment. Uh, people with social anxiety tend to be extremely, um, to have a, a very good emotional intelligence. Um, they need to react, to, to understand how people react around them, they overthink the reaction of other people, they listen to other people a lot more than others, and they tend to build a lot of uh, emotional intelligence that would otherwise lack uh, in uh, neurotypical individuals. Um, a lot of people with anxiety, as I said, don't even know they have anxiety, they just think there is something wrong with them, but they have to cope with that to survive, to, to move forward in society. It's extremely tough, but this builds a lot of resilience. So how do you basically fit them in societies? And um, um, 
just trying to find the mouse here in my presentation. Here it is. Uh, so basically, um, yes, spoiler alert on that. Um, they are uh, uh, very good in working on uh, tasks that are very well uh, specified or tasks where they can uh, find out all the information by yourself. They can work on tasks in your team where you need to find out some information uh, and they can play the role of finding out all this information and all the details for you. Uh, they wouldn't fit in areas where they have to go through tasks without the feeling of being in control or without the possibility to work on some information. If you try to push them into just do this, don't ask why, you basically set them up for failure. But if you push them into an environment where they can find out how things work and be in control of things or feel like they're in control of things, then you actually leverage on this other strength that is attention to details and preparation. When we talk about people with ADD or ADHD, um, there is a definition from Wikipedia that is uh, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a mental disorder of the neurodevelopmental type. It is characterized by problems paying attention, excessive activity, or difficulty controlling behavior, which is not appropriate for a person's age, especially the last part is very depressing because it, again, it focuses only on the negative traits of this. Um, if you have ADHD, ADHD or ADD, you may feel like uh, you, 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 somebody else has a remote control of your brain and you try to focus attention on something, but you're not in control of what you pay attention to. Uh, but this is just one side of it. Another thing is that uh, you actually have, uh, uh, you need to get external motivation to basically uh, move forward. And this builds up extreme resilience to basically uh, get up from tough situations. But also it builds up uh, the ability to always look for uh, support to always look for new things, always look for new projects, and being involved in a lot of projects, sometimes to extreme situations where, for example, you say yes to everything, somebody comes to you, can you please help, you say yes, 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 you just want to be a fixer, you want to help everybody, and this can get you also to be overwhelmed after. But eventually, you try to learn about these things, you try to be aware of these things, and you get better at these things. You get to be highly organized, and you can fit very well in a company, for example, as a leader in this position. You can be a great leader, you can drive a great culture in your team because you would like to see, you would like to, uh, to drive projects in evolving companies, in startups where things constantly change. You will not be a great leader in a company where leadership is not required to drive and to work with different scenarios all the times, but you would be a great leader in a company where, for example, there could be a constant need of somebody able to work in emergency situations because that's where people with ADHD usually drive. Uh, in emergency situation, on the, uh, unlike people with anxiety, people with ADHD can actually thrive and be able to uh, organize a lot of things uh, really well, better than anybody else. Um, you would not want to fit people with ADD or ADHD in, in a boring, repetitive task, in roles that don't change, and uh, in, in, in environments where we constrain people's mind into uh, j just do that, don't, don't go beyond that kind of thing, just do that. I understand you have great ideas, but please just focus on that. That will actually not work, and that, again, will set them up for failure. When we talk about autism, um, Autism is a, a mental condition present from early childhood characterized by great difficulty in communicating and forming relationship uh, with other people and in using language uh, and abstract concepts. So one out of 65, 68 people in the adult age have a mild or severe autism. And uh, basically, don't think about the savant example of Rain Man. This is just uh, an inability of thinking abstractly, an inability of uh, uh, processing emotions. People with autism feel emotion. Studies show that um, uh, it, it sometimes uh, four times higher than uh, a, a neurotypical people, but uh, cannot really be aware of these emotions, struggle to understand the emotions. Uh, but one of the things that people with autism can be extremely strong at is that they can hyper-focus, sponging information vertically about a lot of things uh, and have uh, extremely higher senses. Um, there are studies that also say, show that people with autism can smell gas leaks before other people. People with autism can be extremely rational and they're more likely to be themselves as well. And uh, they have a clear and to the point communication styles. So if you have any task in your team, in your company that require very high attention to details that can be made into repeatable patterns and uh, are very mathematical and logical, then you can find a really, really, really good fit with this kind of personality here. But if you have unstructured task or 
a constantly changing environment that cannot be predicted or cannot be made into a pattern, then again, you set the personalities up for failures. And I, as a team lead, see this as your responsibility to make sure that you find the strength here rather than push the limitation. When we talk about dyslexia, for example, it's actually on the opposite side of autism. People with autism have this brain connector called the mini columns in the cortex that connects brain cells. And the mini column tends to be really, really short. In people with dyslexia, that again is estimated to be from 10% to 20% of adult population, um, this connector is uh, actually quite long, uh, and uh, uh, it brings people with dyslexia to be able to be really good abstract and visual thinker. But here is the thing, the definition of dyslexia is uh, also known as reading disorder, is characterized by trouble with reading despite normal intelligence. This is like, uh, this is from Wikipedia, and is uh, like describing a car by its inability to fly, uh, disregarding, uh, uh, regarding having a normal engine. Um, so dyslexia basically is the inability to uh, put sounds into words and words into sound. It's called phonological processing. And uh, uh, one of the things that the people that have dyslexia tend to excel at uh, is uh, visual thinking, creative thinking, arts. Uh, some say that they can see 3D models completely in their head, uh, can be a very highly creative people and, creative and very good problem solvers. So this brings them to be really good entrepreneurs, so like we can see that Steve Jobs, uh, Albert Einstein, Walt Disney, also great actors like Jim Carrey, all had dyslexia, and many others. And you can find a fit for this neurotype in your team in R&D departments in tasks that require really high visualization activities, uh, abilities, or in, uh, in creative parts of uh, your processes. You will not find a fit and you will set people up for failure if they have dyslexia into logical or mathematical tasks and into, of course, like data entry kind of tasks. They will just constantly fail and it will give you the feeling they're not up to the task, will give them the feeling that they're lacking something or they feel stupid. So it will cause personality and identity crisis and so on. So when we talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, we, we need to make sure that we, we, we talk about a lot about uh, uh, gender equality, we talk about a lot of uh, uh, sexual orientation, cultural, ethnical inclusion. We need to also think about personality and uh, uh, neurodiversity. And we need to be able to make sure that we include all these personalities in our team and we can find a way to make our team and our task and our processes um, in a way that they work around each one of us. So somebody from our world talking about dyslexia defined uh, uh, people with dyslexia as if uh, they use a wide-angle lens to look at things, while people just use a, a standard telephoto lens. But um, um, what I would say is that uh, it's almost like uh, people with autism use a microscope, and people with uh, ADHD are constantly looking around, and people with anxiety look at at everything because they need to be in control of everything. So, so this is really the part. Each is best at revealing different kind of details. And you don't want to just have one kind of lens looking at your things, looking at your task, working on your product. You want to have all of them because from this diversity, you actually find the treasure and you actually you, you can get to build an amazing things where people can balance themselves out. So what can you do as a lead? As a lead, the first thing is don't look for a rule book. The, the four examples I went through are just uh, examples of very, uh, very well-studied personality types. And uh, you don't get to go in a one-to-one -one and somebody comes to you and tells you, hey, I have ADHD, dyslexia, and a little bit of this. And you say, okay, fine, I have the FAQ, I know how to deal with you. It's not gonna be ever like that. <laughs> People are unique, we are all unique. We have a little bit of everything. And. Uh, um, what you need to do is try to understand how people excel. So the limitations are the first things that will come up because they come and they come into a process that is not their own, into an environment that is not their own, unless you get extremely lucky, but it's never the case. I never saw that in my life. And um, uh, what you want to do is get to know the person, get to know the individuals. So have initially a weekly one-to-ones, and then maybe after a one to buy weekly one-to-ones and then settle on once every three weeks. I think that once every month is a, a little bit too long, to be honest, and uh, try to work on small projects. So as a lead, you would like to uh, assign small projects and the ability and the safety, talking about the, uh, the, the, the safety concept from Google, um, the, the environment safety, um, assign them the ability, give them the ability to break out of the process, to break out of the standards and, uh, and the practices that your company imposes uh, to work on this, pro on this small project. Find out what is their best way to achieve a task or to face challenges. And constantly 
check with them how this went, try to get feedback from them on what challenges they faced, if these were challenges that they actually liked to face, or if these were challenges that where they need external help in facing. And um, be the safety net in this. You may find out that they need somebody else to provide something, like they need more details on some things, and they cannot find the details by themselves. They need somebody to be able to communicate externally for them, and you may bond them with somebody in the team that can actually do it for them. Or they need maybe somebody that can uh, um, give them a, a little bit of problem-solving input so they can build up on top of this. So be the safety net and make them understand that it's okay to fail, it's okay to not be able to achieve the task because the only goal is to try to see what are the limitations and uh, one little step at a time, what are the strengths uh, where you want to build on and where they want to build on as well because it's, a, it's something that it requires effort and willpower from both sides. But also, as an individual, that means everybody. What you have to do is you, you need to learn about personality types. You need to learn about neurotypes, about disorders. And there are amazing videos on TED if you look at the Brain Educational Series about uh, uh, people telling you about their experiences of all the things that they face, of the struggle they face, and how they solve the struggles, how they cope with society, and what kind of environments actually work really, really well for them. You need to understand that um, the perception can be very different from intention. We are very unique individuals, and we talk about how to communicate a lot of times, but eventually, uh, people can be very direct, people can be uh, very passionate and very uh, a, a lot less direct in communication, and, and we need to understand that when we feel offended, when we feel that somebody has been a little bit too rude, we may need to first tell the person and ask the person if that was the intention. It does look stupid, but maybe going to the person and say, I felt like uh, you had something to say about me here or that you're not happy with me, is that the case? Put in question your feelings. Don't expect that your emotional interpretation is exactly the same on the other person, on the other individual. We are unique beings. We process things different. We react to the environments differently. And about uh, the way of interacting, this is also really important. There are people that prefer face-to-face -face communication. There are people that prefer just chat and hate the face-to-face -face communication. So, so we need to understand in a team how this works and we need need to be aware of the limitations so that, uh, fine, we can work, we can find solutions around those. Um, one of the recent changes that I uh, implemented in our team was to use stand up as, as an app for stand-ups. So in the morning, everybody started eventually to come late as stand-ups, and was not really the reason for coming late as stand-ups, because you do stand-ups then at 10.30, 10.35, and eventually people come at 10.40, 10.45. Um, it's more about the fact that people don't like to say what they did yesterday, what they do today, what they're going to do today, and if they have any issues. Because if you have a team of 10 people, by the time this person starts to talk, this person is just thinking about what to say. And uh, what we do with stand up -ly is uh, we have a bot on Slack that asks uh, every individual in the team, what are you going to do today? And what is your focus? Do you have any issues? And then we have a stand-up after, where uh, we just stand up maybe for 30 seconds, and it's a team of 20 people. Um, and in these 20 seconds, in these 30 seconds, we just ask anybody if there is anything that needs to be shared with the team, or if, uh, um, or maybe there is like a communication from the lead about what is the current focus of the team, so that everybody is aware. And this makes stand-ups a lot more bearable for everybody, and fits a lot better with the communication style. For some people that were really uncomfortable in stand-ups, it was an acceptable compromise to be able to reply to a Slack bot. And now the stand-ups are just working really well. Um, Humor helps in all of these situations, uh, but it comes with uh, two gotchas. The first thing is don't expect everybody to laugh, and people have a different way of reacting. People may laugh inside and not expressing it, or the opposite. People may actually laugh, but not really find it funny. Um, so just don't worry about these things. Don't impose your reaction on any humor and uh, be respectful. So you can, be, you can use a self-depreciating humor. Don't be offensive towards other people. And uh, try to work together. So push together towards the goal. And the goal really is to be motivated as, as a company, as a team, and to find out that when you want to work with your team, you actually feel happy about being around with your team. If you achieve this goal initially, whatever product, service, or anything that you work on is going to be amazing, because that's going to be your second motivation. Your first is to have a great and safe and healthy working environment. It doesn't work the other way. You can have the best, most amazing, most innovative product to work on, but if you don't have a great team, you're eventually going to quit or make people quit. So 
as a final note, like, uh, where did you lead the team or where did you work with the, uh, with the team? Uh, people are always going to be the key. And uh, each one of us has amazing strengths and limitations. The thing is that the limitations are really easy to recognize. It's really easy to point a finger at somebody and say, oh, you can't do that. But you don't have to do that. You need to find out, oh, you, you actually, this is not a fit for you. Let's find out uh, how, what are your strengths. And you need to work together towards the goals. So don't constrain personalities. This is what society does. This is what education does to our children. This is what we do in a company with our employers, employees. So make personality thrive. Encourage people to be themselves and build the environment around your team, not the other way around. When you do that, you will end up with an amazing, diverse team of people that you will love. Thank you.